Jerry Ormsby, 1989 Winston Top Fuel Champion. Bruce Larson, 1989 Winston Funny Car Champion. And Bob Glidden, 1989 Winston Pro Stock Champion. Gary Ormsby prevailed through two car-destroying accidents to take his first Winston Top Fuel Championship, just nosing out number two finisher, Joe Amato. Bruce Larson won six national events and went six for six against then-defending champion Kenny Bernstein, who finished third in points behind number two, Don Bruto. And what more could be said about Bob Glidden? In 1989, he won his 75th national event title on the way to his 10th overall and 5th consecutive Winston Pro Stock Championship. So the stage was set for Drag Racing 1990. As the season dawned, a major story was unfolding. Funny car powerhouses Don the Snake Prudhomme, along with Kenny Bernstein, defected to the top fuel ranks. How would that development affect the already tight top fuel class? And conversely, who would fill the void in the funny car ranks? We join the season at the beginning for the full story. Welcome to Drag Racing 1990. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave McClellan. And I'm Steve Evans. As always, the NHRA season started at the L.A. County Fairplex of Pomona, California, the Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals. Don Perdome started out pretty well with his new top fueler, qualifying 14th at a 5.15. But in the first round, he had to race the number three qualifier, Joe Amato, who had a 5.03 second elapsed time to kick off his season. Well, if you were a betting man, you had to go with the car in the near lane, the two-time champ, Joe Amato, here at the opening race of the season. But Don Perdome, well, as you'll see, he had other thoughts. It was a great beginning for Don Prudhomme as he took his first round victory in a rear engine top fuel dragster, defeating a troubled Joe Amato. So Amato could not take the measure of the funny car transplant Don Prudhomme. Daryl Gwen hoped to handle Kenny Bernstein in his first dragster effort at the first race of the year. Now Bernstein qualified even quicker than did Don Prudhomme in the seventh spot at a 5.07. Daryl Gwynn hoped that his number two qualifying time of a 5.01 would be sufficient to give him a big advantage over Bernstein, but it really didn't work out that way because in round number one at the Winter Nationals, Bernstein showed some of the brilliance that he revealed throughout the entire year in his driving skill. He was just as cat quick in a top fielder as he had been in a bunny car. Bernstein won it with a hole shot as both drivers recorded 5.01 seconds. In the finals of the opening race of the season, it was Dick LaHaye. He had defeated Gary Ormsby in the final four. His competition was Laurie Johns. Johns had qualified number six at a 5.05 and then went on to defeat Don Prudhomme in the second round and Kenny Bernstein in the final four. And Laurie Johns was rapidly becoming a fan favorite. But of course, to win her first championship, she had to get by this man. The 1987 Winston Top Field champion, Dick LaHaye, who had qualified number nine at a 5.09. Now Laurie, however, had the lane choice going into the final round and took that far side. It was a huge crowd jammed into the Fairplex in Pomona. They watched intently as Laurie deep stayed and then got a very slight advantage, only a thousandth of a second in one great drag race. She took her first ever top fuel title and Laurie's mother went bananas. Does it feel as good as you always imagined it might? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what's happening to me. I, I rolled around when I saw my car go through the lights first. I just thought, how is this happening to me? I mean, somehow I just thought it would never happen. You believed in yourself. Yes. Well, Dave, down at the far end, Lori went over to give a big hug to funny car rookie driver Casey Spurlock. He was down there for very good reasons. You see, this son of a sprint car family won his first ever Nitro funny car event that he entered. He qualified in the 16th spot. That meant in round number one, he raced the number one qualifier, John Force. Force was in the near lane in the unlettered car. The Ford probe in the far lane was Casey Spurlock. And John Force and his crew chief, Austin Coyle, learned a very good lesson on this sunny afternoon at Pomona. Don't ever take them lightly. They watched in disbelief as Spurlock took a one-car length victory. 
From the smiles of being the number one qualifier to the frowns and disappointment of going out round one to a rookie. Well, that's good. That's good for him, and that's what makes it exciting for the fans. But uh, for us, definitely a malfunction. This car has been too consistent the last four runs, and, and it just fell off. Something in the timing just went wrong. Sorry to see you. That's early. Spurlock met another champion. This one, the reigning Winston champ, Bruce Larson, in the final four. Larson had qualified in the number four spot with a 537, and once again, Spurlock was the underdog. And it appeared that Bruce Larson and crew didn't learn a darn thing from watching John Forrest get drilled by the rookie. As you'll soon see, Spurlock and his young crew chief, Ronnie Swearingen, were right on top of things. If forced back down the horsepower, it appeared Larson hopped it up. He smoked the tires. Before the final round, Steve asked Spurlock, why not oval track racing? I guess because I've been around it all my life, I had to go do something different. It sure would have been cheaper to go sprint car racing, that's for sure. Is it with your family support and encouragement? Very much so. Without them, there's no way I could do this. This year, we're without a major sponsor. We have a lot of help from our associate sponsors. But without mom and dad, there's, there's no way I could be out here. Spurlock certainly picked on some of the tough ones, Steve. In the finals, it was Ed McCulloch, the number two qualifier of the competition. That's right, and just about everyone had left the starting line before Spurlock, and McCullough would be no exception. He had a nice little hole shot until that deer lane wouldn't hold his power. Spurlock had problems, coasted through at only 186 miles an hour, but that didn't matter. Talk about long odds. A youngster from Tennessee comes out of the alcohol ranks into the Nitro Wars and wins his first NHRA national event on his first try. That's long odds. And Steve, especially from the number 16 qualifying spot, he gave hope to slower qualifying everywhere. In pro stock qualifying at the Winter Nationals, Rich Marino was in the far lane matched against Harry Scribner. Problems set in for Marino at about half track. Well, Mac, just when he had missed both Walls and Harry Scribner, we thought he had it saved. Eight snap rolls, I counted, but out of the car came Rich Marino. He was unhurt. Just got, got a little bit loose, started shaking the tires, got a little bit loose, and when I got out, she looked up, and it just got loose. I thought I had her saved there for a while. Then it made one violent turn, and all I knew was upside down, sliding on the track. In the finals of Pro Stock Eliminator, Jerry Eckman, who had qualified number one with a 729, raced the leading Chevrolet at the start of the season. That's Bruce Allen, the number three qualifier, who had a 732 to put him in the program. We thought the top fuel final was close. Watch Pro Stock. Eckman had not won a race since 1988, the Summer Nationals. Here, the margin was only three thousandths of a second as Ekman picked up the Winter Nationals title. Did you know you'd won? I knew I won. I, I knew it was close. I could see Bruce with me all the way, but when we started getting into high gear, I saw it coming, and I thought, here it is. My big win this year for Penzoil, Pontiac, the whole team. And it's on to Phoenix for Jerry Ekman. And it's on to Phoenix for the rest of the Winston Championship Drag Racing Trail. It was the second race of the season, the Buttercraft Quality Parts Arizona National. This race had previously been run in the fall, but was switched to the early spring to take advantage of the great weather in Phoenix. And the weather couldn't have been nicer, but the problem for Don Perdome and qualifying couldn't have been greater. After a decent debut performance at the Winter Nationals, this was what happened at Phoenix fire and oil and qualifying then in round number one he had to face up with frank bradley and those problems for prudhomme continued in round number one as bradley in the near lane pulled away when prudhomme went up in smoke and bradley knocked to 514 and phoenix a respectable dive now shirley muldowney qualified outstandingly at 4.97 not a big surprise because she had won the last national event held here at firebird raceway it was one of the new kids on the top fuel block that was Shirley's competition in round number one. New kid, Kenny Bernstein. And much like he did Daryl Gwynn at the Winter Nationals, it was Kenny Bernstein off the mark first against Shirley Muldowney with quite an advantage, but Muldowney was very quick to strike back. Shirley pulled alongside by half track, then at the finish line, she had a few feet advantage and took the victory. Kenny was quick to talk about his problems. What's been the toughest challenge for your crew adapting to this 
top field dragster. Making this thing run on eight cylinders, that's been the headache. If it'll run on eight, it'll run good, but it just doesn't want to run on eight all the time. We haven't quite figured it out, but Armstrong will get her handled. Oh, I know that. Dave, after that interview, Kenny mumbled something about having lost at two national events and still hadn't been beaten by a man. This lady, Lori Johns, beat him at Pomona. Here at Phoenix, she joined the Craiger Four Second Club. Well, welcome to the club. It's hard to believe. Joe Rekka told me yesterday, he said, Lori, I don't think you're going to make it. It's getting tighter and tighter, and there's not many places left, but it, I, here I am. Lori had referred to Joe Horutka, the owner of the Craiger Company. Lori's 497 time in qualifying earned her a spot in the field. She raced Kenny Koretsky in her first round competition. Koretsky smoked the tires, but Lori Johns had problems far more severe, and it was Koretsky who idled across the finish line to take a surprising upset win. And erasing that four-second grin from the face of Lori Johns. Here in the final four, one particular race shaped up as a fan favorite. Gary Ornsby, the reigning Winston champion, versus the three-time champion, Shirley Muldowney, already with a four-second run to her credit at this event. Muldowney was on the near side of the racetrack. And she left right with Ornsby until this happened. A power wheel stand for Muldowney moved her over into Ormsby's lane. It was a near collision, but great driving on the part of both Muldowney and Ormsby prevented a disaster. Well, you know who the real race car drivers are when things like that happen, Shirley. Great job. Had my hands full, Steve, but uh, what a great car. It just, you know, I could, it was up so fast, I couldn't believe it. And then I saw that line coming. I was praying that Ormsby, I knew it was Ormsby. I mean, I was thankful it was Ormsby is what I wanted to say. You had a pro in the other lane as well. Yeah, I thought, golly, I'm telling you, it was on a heck of a pass. Well, this guy's got a great future. Great car, I'm telling you. Not a bad driver either. Thank you, Steve, appreciate it. Ormsby made a move any sprint car driver would have been proud of. Well, the reigning Winston champ moved to the finals to meet the man that finished second in the world last season. We're talking about Joe Amato. Here, Tim Richards, the crew chief, directed the action for Amato preparing his dragster for that final round confrontation. You know, any time these two guys get together over the past several seasons, it's more than just another drag race. Tremendous pride at stake. Hornsby having robbed Amato of the number one, Amato in 1990 wanting it back desperately. Ormsby used his 1989 technique, an advantage off the starting line, but it did not hold as Amato drove from behind to take the Arizona Nationals title. And an amazing victory, too, Dave, considering that the Amato engine was shedding parts and fire and pieces from 1,000 feet to the finish line. When you couple his first round loss with Amato's victory at Phoenix, he was tied for second with Lori Johns leading the Winston points chase was Gary Ormsby after two races. Well, Dave, on the funny car side of things, it was beginning to look as if Maynard Yanks might have what it would take to help Bruce Larson defend his number one. In the final, they would go up against the Over the Hill Gang car, driven by Dale Poldy. All the Over the Hill Gang. They have so many crew members, they have their own zip code. <laughs> Steve, I'm sure you're going to tell me next they all live in a one-room apartment somewhere. But Dale Poldy is certainly one of the premier drivers in this sport, and he proved that Phoenix. Absolutely. They would live in a one-bedroom apartment if it meant this would happen at every national event. The underdog car rents by Bill Schultz in the winner's circle. The fans, especially the ones from Southern California who had made the trip over, loved it. Well, a wise man once said, when you go over the hill, you start picking up speed. And speed what it was all about for Dale Pulley. Tremendous job. What happened out there? Well, the car got out there, and it got a little bit, it started to shake and got a little bit loose. And I didn't see him, so I took the chance of pedaling the thing, rather than having to smoke the tires or do something crazy. And uh, I don't know what happened to Bruce, but uh, he's a world champion. He's the one I needed to beat. Those problems for Larson severe enough to cost him a shot at the Phoenix title. The final in pro stock was a classic Ford versus Chevrolet battle. Bob Glidden against the Arizona resident from Yuma. We're talking about Gordy Rivera. That's right. In the previous round, Gordy Rivera had cut a perfect 4.00 light, and you can bet that Bob Glidden knew it. He couldn't afford to be late, even though Glidden was the number one qualifier with a very quick 7.28 second elapsed time. Even though the fans loved the Ford from Bob Glidden, Gordy Rivera is from Tucson, and they were right with him. 
The light flashed on the dash, telling Bob Glidden when to pull the levers in the transmission. He pulled ahead of Gordy Rivera. His son, Billy, reacted to the victory. You know, it was just our day, Steve. We came out Friday in the first run. We went a 28 with a zero. Uh, you know, what can you say? The old probe probed him today. <laughs> <laughs> and you showed tremendous promise for the rest of the season, Gordy. You and Grumpy Jenkins together. Thank you. I'm just happy to be here with everybody. Happy to have you both Thank down you. here. Appreciate it. Bob Lidden certainly looks strong at the early part of the season. Going to Houston. That was the song the drag racers sang as they moved to Houston Raceway Park. Not only one of the true new super tracks with all of the spectator and racer amenities, but also one of the finest racing surfaces the sport has ever known. And Steve, this racetrack attracted one of the finest fields in the history for the Fram Super Nationals. Connie Coletta attempted to qualify in top fuel. Now, Connie Coletta wishes he hadn't come to Houston Raceway Park at all, and you're about to see why. This is violent. The rear wing breaks, Coletta loses control, as you can well see, head on into the guardrail, right where it made a turn to the left, looking up the track. The thing a top fuel driver fears more than anything else, Dave, and I think you'll agree, is any kind of head-on impact as Coletta suffered. Steve, in slow motion, you can see the absolute violence of this crash. After the impact with the guardrail, Coletta's car barrel rolled in the air coming down on the roll cage, then slid across the track, came to rest against the opposite side guardrail. Just about all the worst things that can happen in a top fuel crash. First, the head on impact, then upside down right on the top of the roll bar, and now into the far wall roll bar first. Collada was very carefully extracted from the race car. He did spend a few days in a Houston hospital, but he said he was maybe better off for the experience. A friend called, asked of his condition. He was reported as conscious, alert, and stable. Three things Connie said he'd never been at the same time in his life. The man you saw in the gold and white fire suit running in to help Coletta was Daryl Gwen, and what a weekend he had. Daryl, would it mean anything to you to be the quickest driver in the history of NHRA Championship drag racing? No question, Steve. You are. Uh, we, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it obviously doesn't win tomorrow's race, but uh, 490 obviously will uh, help us go into tomorrow's event. Um, it's a great feeling, you know, we've been struggling at the beginning of the year, and uh, to come back and run 490 in the heat of the day here at this Houston facility is uh, quite a thrill for me. That 4.909 was a new national record for Daryl Gwynn, and it still stands today. And in round number one, Gwynn took that far lane, tried to improve on that record, way too much traction. Gwynn, a giant wheel stand, Frank Randy, what a break. He smoked the tires, but still took the victory. And the look on Daryl Gwynn's face revealed it all. The disappointment he felt at the wheel stand costing him a shot at the Houston title. The huge rear slicks on these top fuel cars grow on the burnout much like they do at the finish line at high speed. They only get a few inches wide when the RPMs are up. We show you Gene Snow making the burnout because he was one half of the top fuel final. And there's the crew chief for the other half, Ken LaHaye. She heads the team that fields the top fuel dragster driven by Dick LaHaye. Steve talked with her before the final. At the Winter Nationals, you underestimated Laurie Johns. What about here? We did underestimate Lori John, so we just tried to go out there to repeat. I think today we're going to try to do the same thing. It's one of more races trying to repeat than to step on it. Good philosophy. So in her second final of the year, Kim used the same technology, but she certainly wanted the outcome to be different between her dad and Gene Snow. The red light by Gene Snow at the starting line settled that question, answered it immediately, LaHaye the champion. You've won a lot of them, but wouldn't you call this one of your better performances the entire weekend? Oh, it's the best ever. Best ever. I mean, uh, it's four or five four-second runs, and that's more than we made all last year. And, I mean, what can I say? I'm just thrilled to no end. Going for the championship in a big way with these points. Yeah, yeah, I guess we could start thinking about that, couldn't we? <laughs> Let the celebration begin, huh? Yeah, it's time, Steve. Thank you. LaHaye took over the points lead following his championship victory at Houston.
And in the funny car pitch, John Four has sat in the roll cage of his funny car, nervously looking at his watch for some reason, as crew chief Austin Coyle warmed up that motor before the race. Force feeling a little confident. This was his first final of the 1990 season, but he was up against Bruce Larson, number one. Larson was defeated in the final at Phoenix. He wanted to not do that again. But Larson never had a shot at Force after the tires went up in smoke and Force crossed the finish line. The victor running a 5.36 second elapsed time. Talk about burn off some nervous energy. John Force knew how to do it in Houston. Bruce Larson used his two final round appearances to take an early Winston points lead. John Force moved from fifth to second by virtue of East Houston victory. Well, Daryl Gwynn wasn't the only pro setting records. This man, Mark Powick, enjoyed his finest moment ever in the pro stock category. In qualifying, 7.22 second elapsed time. That one in the books is the all-time record. Black in round number one. Ricky Smith in the near lane was off the starting line first. A bit of a hole shot. Powett did not catch him, even though he ran quicker, and the new record holder was humbled. Mark, this fork can just take him in, psyche, and stomp on it. Yeah, it did, Steve. <laughs> you know, when you're up on top and you run good all weekend, you can't give up, and I don't know if, you know, if it was me or the car, but uh, we're going to be back. You know, it's, it's a disappointment to me. I was really feeling good today. But there's many more races to come yet, and uh, we're sure not quitting. We're going to give it a... Another great shot. And you're the quickest in the world. So far, and I'm going to keep it. Two out of three final round appearances for Bruce Allen earned him the Winston points lead after Houston. He lost in the final round to W.J. Warren Johnson at the Super Nationals. Well, then the Winston Tour smoked its tires all the way to Gainesville, Florida, home of Gainesville Raceway and the Motorcraft Gator Nationals. The biggest crowd, Dave McClellan, in the history of this facility. Improved roads, added seating, all kinds of extra grandstands, and the fans down in that part of the world have really responded. And Steve Evans, they were treated to some great qualifying. Daryl Gwynn had a 498. Number one in pro stock was Jerry Ekman, and this man, Jim White, took the number one qualifying spot with a 528 in funny car. His best performance ever in Roland Leong's Hawaiian automobile, Dodge Daytona body. It was in the near lane in round number one. Glenn Micros on the opposite side. Now watch what happens to the left rear slick. Safety equipment is excellent. Murph McKinney built the chassis. Uh, he did an excellent job. It, everything does what it's supposed to do, you know. What do you think happened? Well, it's hard to say. That was a brand new tire, brand new set of tires for first round this morning. Uh, uh, it looks like the tire just uh, came apart somehow. I don't know. We'll, we'll just get it over and get the Goodyear guys to take a look at it. They do an excellent job, too. We can't complain about the product they give us. Absolutely. Never an easy way to lose, but certainly the expensive ones hurt, and Jim White went out in round number one. You just saw Bernie Federley, the crew chief for Ed McCulloch, as he prepared the Oldsmobile to race against the Ford. A.C. Spurlock was hoping for his second win of the season, but it was not to be, as Ed McCulloch and Bernie Federley certainly had their act together. What is it they say? Age and treachery will overcome youth and exuberance any time. We'll take it. <laughs> what we run? In 533. Well, we'll take that. I don't know. It's just... Uh... You know, we got some new Goodyear tires on here, and uh, I don't know, they're working good. Yep, they were working good, but not good enough to knock Bruce Larson out of the points lead. His consistency kept him on top. McCullough second, Spurlock third, John Forrest in the fourth spot after the Gator National. A huge crowd was on hand at Gainesville Raceway. They jammed this facility. The largest crowd in the history of the Gator Nationals saw in the top fuel round one, Joe Amato in the near lane against Eddie Hill, who went up in smoke. But so did Amato. And Eddie Hill recovered for the win. And Fuzzy Carter set the standing high jump mark. I thought it was Nadia Komenich. Later, we rode with Kenny Bernstein as he faced off with Chris, the Greek Karamazinas. Bernstein continuing to find out top field is no piece of cake. He had to shut his car off, and the Greek thundered by. Carol Gwynn's crew chief, Ken Vini, was obviously optimistic, shown by the smile on his face as he prepared the race car to go against Eddie Hill in the Gator Nationals final. Of course, Daryl out of Miami, obviously the crowd favorite. They were not disappointed.
Joe, going a 5-0-1, a winning round, a winning race. That puts you second in the points. I'll tell you, that's exactly what the doctor ordered here today, Steve. Uh, we'll take it any way we can get it. I'll tell you, the run was over quick. The last thing I remember was leaving the starting line, and here I am in the winner's circle. So uh, thank the good Lord for where we're at today and all of our sponsors. And those Winston points. You bet. Invaluable Winston points. I'll tell you, we got off to a slow start, but hopefully we can gain up some points here in, in the next couple races. Thank you. Dick LaHaye maintained his Winston points lead, but after the win at Gainesville, Daryl Gwynn was nipping at his heels. Gary Ormsby was third, Snow fourth, and Lori Johns was in fifth. Pro stock driver Jerry Ekman came into the Gator National second in points, but in round one, he suffered a real wrist slitter. He was so late off the starting line that his lower lap's time at the event, 527, wasn't enough to catch Buddy Ingersoll for what damage Ingersoll did to Ekman's points hopes. We rode along with Bob Glidden in the final four as he raced Ricky Smith. Take a look at the left side of your screen. You can figure out who won this one. Yeah, yeah, I love it, Steve. It don't get no better than this. I, I just let, you know, me and Bob's been competitors for years, and I'm just glad to finally beat him. Kenny Delco in the near lane drove his Pontiac into the finals to race against the other Pontiac, that one driven by Ricky Smith. And Ricky Smith found that unlike Bob Glidden, on this late afternoon, Kenny Delco could match wheels with him right off the starting line, and that spelled the difference. Steve Delco outpowered Smith all the way to the finish line to win his first ever Pro Stock title. Tell me about the race. You left the line together. I the clutch. The thing stood up and yeah, didn't shake the tires when I pulled the second. I said, there's no way he's going to go by me. The middle of April of 1990 found the NHRA Winston Championship Trail moving to mid-Georgia and the new Atlanta Dragway for the AC Delco Southern Nationals. But the mood there was very somber because the racing world had just learned of the crash at Santa Pod Raceway in England of Daryl Gwynn. At that Santa Pod Raceway in New Bedfordshire, England, Daryl was severely injured. His left arm had to be amputated below the elbow and he is paralyzed from the chest down. The outpouring of love, and at this point in time, even more importantly, money for the Daryl Gwynn Recovery Fund. Dave was unlike anything I've ever seen. Every fan wanted to participate, and every racer. There wasn't a car without a message or a yellow ribbon. Even though they all had Daryl on their mind, there was a race to be won. Lori Johns earned her way into the Final Four, where she challenged the Winston champion, Gary Ormsby. The difficult task was Johns. The thoughts were with Daryl Gwynn, but the challenge on the racetrack from Ormsby was one that had to be overcome. And Lori prevailed. She moved to her second final round appearance of the year. You know, we're very happy to be where we are. We had fallen behind in the points a little bit, and we said if we could just make a decent showing in Atlanta, and so far it's been pretty decent. But so far was only as good as your last opponent. Then she ended up having to run the number one qualifier, Joe Amato, in the final. Remember her victory back at the Winter Nationals over Dick LaHaye by just inches? Well, watch this one against Joe Amato. Lori was away first, and again by inches. She had taken her second national event title of the year. The crew, well, they were berserk on the starting line. Her mother, her father, her crew chief, Larry Meyer, coming into the picture there on the left. They were celebrating because the Winston points lead in top fuel had become Lori's. Dick LaHaye in second place, Joe Amato in third, and Gary Ormsby now seriously wondering if his title was defensible, riding in that fourth position. At Atlanta, there was one man in funny car that was having the weekend of his life. We're talking about Paul Smith, who was qualified eight. He had to run the number one qualified car, Jim White, in round number two. This was the second race in a row that White qualified first and went out early. Paul Smith advanced to the final four. It's got some good motor parts, but it's got some old Paul Smith in it. In other words, the valves are a little smaller, and I try to you know, keep you know, the overhead down. And me and Chuck, we try to do this without a sponsor, but we're getting close to get one, and if we get one, we're gonna be some winners. Well, the Chuck is Chuck Eccles, the man who owns and usually drives that car, but at Atlanta, his crew chief, Paul Smith, was doing a whale of a job, Dave McClellan. In the final four, he took on the state of the art. Could be called low buck against high tech. John Force was the opponent for Paul Smith. 
and Force felt the sting. 535 for Smith, 537 for John. How long have you been doing this? Uh, 20 years. And have never won an NHRA national event? Nope, and then the semis, they did a final once. Here we go, hope we can do it, guys. Well, Paul's Hollywood script was missing the final page. He ran up against Ed McCullough, the ace intent on winning his second national event in a row. McCulloch was far ahead when Smith went up in smoke, and it was Ed McCulloch. That win at Atlanta moved him into the lead of the Winston Point standings. Larson second, Force in third, Spurlock fourth, Mark Oswald making an appearance now in the top five. Well, the Pro Stock final round featured Larry Morgan, who suddenly was waving a great big stick in his Bob Pinello-owned Oldsmobile. Qualified in the number eight spot, but that was not really indicative of what they might be capable of at Atlanta. In the final round, they met up with Warren Johnson, yet another Oldsmobile on the right side of your screen. Watch the Christmas tree. That will tell you the story. Nope, not a whole shot, just the opposite. A red light by Warren Johnson. He knew he had to take a shot at Morgan, who had the stronger engine. Morgan proved it, 731 to a 736. At the far end, I talked to a, well, a very happy Buckeye. I really felt like I'd win. I really did. I, I'm really pretty up. I just can't believe it. Your 731 was quicker than his elapsed time. He wasted it on a red light anyway. Yeah, I saw a red light. I, you know, I, I kind of figured he would. But kind of like Winston Cup stock car racing, you don't have to win races to leave the points. Bruce Allen was still on top and hadn't seen the winner's circle. Warren Johnson, though, Jerry Ackman, Bob Glidden, and Kenny Delco closing in. The next race on the Winston Championship Trail was in Western Tennessee. We went to Memphis. The Chief Auto Parts Mid-South Nationals presented by TNN jammed the Memphis Motorsports Park facility. And boy, what a top fuel final they saw. They, of course, had watched all the television shows and read all the magazines and heard about this gal named Lori Johns. Well, they got to see her in yet another final, again up against Joe Amato, the same opponent she had to defeat at the previous race in Atlanta. Lori had to change engines after her second round win, but she ran a 499 in the final four. Steve talked with her. Uh, yeah, I knew it was going to run a 499 just as soon as we got it to make a full pass. It, it kept having problems. We wheel stood it, we shook it, we threw the biller belt off, we kicked the rods out, and now it's running 499. So that's all we need to, to win this race. Yeah, we're just glad to be in the final, you know. It's been a tough race, and the teams are all running good right now. So it'll be two times now and we're in the final against Lori, so maybe we can reverse the outcome in the last race. But we'll have us a good drag race either way. They both staged ever so carefully, and it paid off for a motto. Watch the car in the near lane, and you will see a tenth of a second advantage disappear into a cloud of smoke. When the clutch started to lock up, it was all over for Joe Amato. Lori Johns took the points and the victory. Somebody asked me if it was getting easier, and I don't think it's getting easier. It's easier because we're winning, but getting there's not any easier. Five flat. Five flat. That's not what I expected, but gosh, it won the race, so we can't complain about it. This is going to be a real fast car. It, it feels fantastic. going to be? <laughs> it's real fast now. You can't really complain about it. It's just, I'm really, really kind of astonished right now. I can't believe that we've won three of the six races this year. It's very, very hard for me to believe. Her three victories gave her the points lead over Amato. Third was LaHaye, Ormsby fourth, and Gene Snow was number five after Memphis. You know, in pro stock at the Arizona Nationals in Phoenix, we saw Bob Glidden win and uh, get a rare good start at the beginning of a season. Well, he was starting to flounder a little bit by the time we got to uh, Memphis in May. Uh, in the final four, he met up with the Dodge of Daryl Alderman. And Alderman needs a track that could give him the kind of traction the dragsters and funny car guys like because of the short wheelbase of the automobile. It tends to be very squirrely. But against Glidden, he was up to it. Mike Sullivan Cucci from the Wayne County Speed Shop had his fist in the air for the first time in 90. For the second race in a row, Larry Morgan wheeled his Oldsmobile into the final round, this time against the Dodge of Alderman. In pro stock particularly, the driver's ability to leave the starting line on time and most importantly ahead of his competition can spell the margin of victory at the finish line. Watch this one. This is almost a dead heat race. Absolutely. Alderman had the jump. Morgan had the power. It all balanced out. Morgan wins it 727 to a 730. We had a little victory chat. 
thank God for this. I'm happy. What was your favorite seven dwarf? <laughs> I don't want to say. Happy would be my guess. <laughs> happy. Thanks a lot, Steve. Well, the second race in a row, Larry Morgan, the champion, and that moved him to number five. Fourth was Bruce Allen in the Winston Point standings. Third, W.J. Second, Bob Glidden and Jerry Ackman was the leader. Now it was time for a little gumbo, and shrimp, romalot, and all your favorite foods. Big Mac as the tour took us to State Capitol Dragway, the High Low Auto Parts Cajun National. And believe it or not, it did not rain a drop at Baton Rouge, and that is unique. It was way too hot to rain. Well, that's typical of South Louisiana weather in the summertime, hot and humid. Lori Johns found out exactly what the heat of the day can do to you as she was challenged by Mike Rutherden. Lori went into a wheel stand that could have been disastrous. Here, it cost her the race. We're not as upset about it as we could be. We're real happy with what we did this weekend because we ran in the heat. We had a 9, 10, 60 foot on that pass, and now we know we can make it through the summer and we can be competitive. Joe Amato is still 22 points behind us at this point, and he's got to race Gene Snow next next round and Gene's got late choice and ran a 513 so it's not that we don't like Joe we just like for Gene to get to the finish line first this time. Steve it sounds like to me that the woman had her eyes on the prize. Well she didn't have to worry about what Gene Snow did because Joe Amato in the left side of your screen took care of himself with a red light. He had Snow beaten soundly had he not left too soon. I can only hope that Joe Amato saw his red light because I'd hate to be the one to tell him. Well, by that look, he obviously did not see it. I didn't see it? No. I read later, really? Indeed. <sighs> that hasn't happened in years. No, no, I just, I was pushing for a good tree, and I guess I just overpushed it, you know? The loss in round number two by Amato certainly opened the door for this man, the reigning Winston champ, Gary Ormsby. He was challenged by Gene Snow in the final round of Top Fuel. And Ormsby's crew chief, Lee Beard Dave, appeared to be finally getting a handle on the new rules. The 320 gear ratio mandated by NHRA and no electronic clutch management systems. Had to be pneumatic or hydraulic. And this was the first time it appeared they really got it to work. What a drag race. The hole shot by Ormsby paid off. He won the Cajun. The reigning Winston champ has struck his first blow of the 90s. Congratulations, Gary. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to ever happen, Steve. It was a great job for the crew, you know, to, I don't know what we ran. 515. 515, I knew it was going to step up a little bit. Anyone that wins on this racetrack and under these conditions, they did a super job for me this weekend. A very tight points race in top fuel after the Cajuns. Only 22 points separate numbers one, two, and three. John's first, Hornsby second, about out third. And back on the bunny car pit, the youngest driver of them all, at this time anyway, Richard Hartman was getting that car ready to face off with John Force, the youngster's first ever final in the Nick Bonnenfant car. Hartman could be a graphic example for youngsters trying to figure out how do you get into the cockpit of a nitro-burning funny car when you earn your way there. He came up through the ranks in his family operation, starting with an alcohol car. And those skills certainly paid off. He gave John Force a great race, just inches separated them at the finish line. A whole shot, I can't believe it, I thought I was late. I can't hardly talk, it's those brazens again. <clears throat> I thought I was late. You weren't late. What was the times? 45 to a 44. 45 to a 40? He ran quicker? Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha! Cool, where's he at? You could gag John Forrest and he could still talk. Well, that question we asked earlier, who would fill the void of Bernstein and Perdome, was being answered by Cajun's time. Ed McCullough and John Forrest, the only two-time event winners, were on top. In pro stock, Mark Powick was trying to win his first ever national event title, while his competition in the final round, Larry Morgan, was trying to make it three in a row. The hot topic in pro stock was Morgan and his Osmobile, and Mark Powick really did nothing to put that fire out. A starting line advantage for Powick did not last long as Morgan pulled ahead and by half a car length made it a hat trick. Three in a row for Larry Morgan. You know, when you give a guy a hammer, what's he supposed to do? Use it. <laughs> <laughs> when you use it on Mark Bowick. Let me tell you, buddy, I am happy. Like a rocket in the pro stock point standings, Larry Morgan vaulted to number one from his number five spot, W.J. second, Jerry Ekman third.
Larry took all of his happiness along with everyone else and moved to the Budweiser Spring Nationals National Trail Raceway outside of Columbus, Ohio, where it rained. Then it rained some more. Then it rained a little bit more. Then it really rained to the point that the whole event had to be postponed to the following weekend, where in round number one of Top Fuel, we again saw Lori Johns. Would she again lose in the initial stanza? She hoped not. Not too long ago, I, in fact, it was last weekend, Joe Amato and I were on the news live together, and when I walked into the TV station, he turned around and he said, how's your neck? I said, it's fine, why? And he said, well, I thought maybe it hurt from all that looking over your shoulder. <laughs> and uh, that is the way it is. It's a little bit harder, I think, to be, be number one, but just by a very narrow lead, and puts a lot of pressure on, we really want to win today. And going into first round, we have Don Prudhomme, and I think it's going to be tough. So we just got to get past him and try to make this one work. Well, a 12-point lead in top fuel Winston points racing is almost nothing. Now, Lori was late off of the mark. Don Perdome ran a slower lap time of 513 and defeated Lori's 510. So first at uh, the Cajuns, it was a wheel stand, and now it'd be just a little late. And that 12-point lead disappeared as Don Prudhomme prevailed. Here in round number two, it was Gary Ormsby who exploded an engine on the starting line. He had to watch as Prudhomme crossed the finish line and advanced to the final four. This was a great day for Don Prudhomme. Steve, it really isn't there yet, to be honest with you. Uh, we're just still playing with it. I, I think we have a few more runs to go, but it just gets a little bit better each time, and it's really been a struggle, you know, the heat sure. and humidity and so on. It's tough. It's becoming a better toy to play with, though. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot of fun so far. <laughs> well, this is the best Stay Snake has had since he's gone top fuel racing again. Frank Hawley, the new driver of the Daryl Glenn cart, was up to the task. Qualified number one, 504. Frank, all of us involved in this great sport of drag racing are thrilled to death to see you carry Daryl Gwynn's banner into the semifinal round the first time out. Well, you know, uh, I've said this a bunch of times, but uh, Ken Vini and, and Gary Clark and, and of course, Daryl's dad, Jerry, here, they've got this car running very, very well. It's made it very easy for me to just step in, uh, obviously, with a number one qualifier and then go into the semifinal round. And uh, I think if they can keep that performance advantage up and I can maybe not make any big mistakes, right. we, we may be in the final. Well, Frank was making no mistakes whatsoever. Don Perdome, the only mistake he made was facing off with Frank Holley. <laughs> he, I don't think it was really his option. He had no choice. The pairings found Holly and Perdome in the final four. As we heard, though, in our interview with Perdome, he said, we still need to play with this car a bit more. And his 540 here wasn't even close to Frank Holly and the Gwen car at 506. And that pitted Frank Holly up against Joe Amato. Terrific top fuel final in Columbus, Ohio. By virtue of this final round appearance, Amato had moved into the lead of the Winston point standings. Holly obviously was not in contention. Daryl's dad, Jerry, continued in his role as team manager of the top fuel dragster and directed traffic for Frank as he backed up after his burnout. Amato was in the far lane. Holly was in the near lane. This is the final round of Top Fuel Eliminator at the Spring National. Everyone was riding with Frank Holly. Let's be honest about it. Everyone except Joe Amato. The emotions of the moment. Daryl still in the hospital in England. They wanted the gold car, and they got exactly that. Frank Holly at 5-12 wins the Budweiser Spring National. Steve, not only were the emotions of victory prevalent on the starting line, but the emotions of the entire Daryl Gwynn incident. Jerry over getting the congratulations from Lex Dudas and Steve Gibbs of NHRA. Then Ron Winters with Budweiser, the event sponsor, came over and offered his congratulations to Jerry, even though the Gwynn car is sponsored by Coors. Daryl Gwynn put me here. This is really his spot, this little piece of real estate. Daryl's, and I'm, I'm just occupying it for a while. Thank you, Frank. While Frank Hawley was a two-time Winston champion of the Wheel of the Funny Car, this was his first win ever in a top fuel dragster, serving notice to the rest of the field that he may be a spoiler throughout the season. Joe Amato moved into the lead, Ormsby second, Laurie Johns dropped to third. And David, the Funny Car points turmoil continued because when Bruce Larson beat the points leader at McCullough in round one, it opened the door for John Forrest to take the points lead. Forrest in the final round met up with Jim White. We had been calling Jim White a winner just looking for a place to happen. But unfortunately, it wouldn't happen at National Trail Raceway. He got outpowered by John Forrest. 
That marked John Force's third victory of the 1990 season. Yesterday, Carl said, we are dead meat here today. And I said, well, buddy, that's what I pay you for. Go out there and fix this whole heap so we can all keep our jobs. And he did it, but he had me worried. He changed blowers in the final. He turned around and he said, you know, you know, old, uh, old Roland over there and them old boys are going to get real tricky. And uh, it worked. What can I say? It stepped up. Three races this year, the Winston points lead, the greatest year ever for the brute one, John Force. Force's lead was a slim one, a little over 600 points over Ed McCulloch. Bruce Larson, without a win thus far this season, moved down to the number three spot. And you talk about upsets. How about Bob Glidden failing to qualify in pro stock? This was his last shot at it. He couldn't do it. It's been seven years since it had happened. Well, we've really been fortunate over the years, Steve. You know, we won a lot of races, and it's been a while since we haven't qualified, but it really doesn't help the moment. Uh, you know, this is racing. It happens to all of us. Uh, if it hasn't happened to you yet, watch out. It's going to. Bob Glidden really troubled in mid-1990. Jerry Ekman beat Ricky Smith at Columbus. That gave him the points lead. W.J. second, Larry Morgan third. And it was on to the French-speaking province of Quebec, Canada, for the Le Grand National Molson, the only NHRA venue held outside of the United States. If Don Prudhomme thought he had problems at Columbus, they were nothing compared to San Air. Watch Prudhomme in the far lane. Every drag racer's nightmare, a blowover, the car turning completely over backwards. It then slammed into the guardrail and jumped over the rail, the engine still running. You see the car shuddering off the racetrack as the engine and the big rear slick boring a hole down into the dirt. But out of the wreckage popped Don Prudeau. The NHRA safety safari on the scene as Kenny Bernstein, fellow driver, ran to his aid. In this long angle, you can see what happened clearly. The front wheels are bouncing off the starting line. As the clutch stages continue to lock up, that bounce gets higher and higher until the wind suddenly gets under the car. There's nothing the snake can do. The only thing that kept this from being even worse than it was as the car sheds all of its body panels is the very strong wing support acted almost like wheelie bars. But not quite. Rocking back onto that wing strut, you see the assembly holding the rear wheels off the ground until finally it tilted off to one side. The car slid down the center of the track and then backed into the guardrail. The tires still getting traction on their sidewalls, pinwheel the car, roll cage burst into the wall, then they get traction on the wall and pull it over it. Hey, you're all right, Snake? Yeah, I'm all right, Steve. You race a whole career, 25 years, almost incident-free, and in one year, it just, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, I know, it just started to come up on me there, and it was, you know, picked him up a little bit and set him down, and then it really, really came up. I, I don't quite understand it right at the moment. Well, if you stay between the walls, that's one thing, but when it went over the rail, that's when you frightened us, and I'm sure yourself as well. Yeah, I didn't know where I was at, obviously. I mean, I, I thought, oh, no, you know, I grabbed the brake and tried to stop it and everything, but it was just too late. It just went, went over center, and it was over with. Join your family. Right. Okay, fine. I set it back down. I thought everything was fine. All of a sudden, it came up. Don Prudhomme reassuring his wife, Lynn, and his daughter, Donna, that he is okay. And while Prudhomme had his share of problems in qualifying the race, had the problems of rain on Sunday morning, and did it rain. Every time the safety safari would dry up a quarter mile, it would rain again, but they persevered. And Sunday afternoon, we heard the thunder in the pipes, and the biggest surprise in top fuel had to be Chris Caramassini, Chicago, Illinois, over the age of 60, qualified with a 516, and in the second round, ran up against three-time event winner Laurie Johns, who was thumbs up with confidence. Well, Lori Johns may have been a three-time event winner to this point. She was also a two-time loser in round number one. Well, she got one round further in Canada, but the Greek, almost out of control, pulled it off. We're going to have to get it here one way or another. You know, we're, we're falling back into points, and, and we want to win this world championship, and we're going to have to figure it out. You know, Larry told me last week they have a combination, and I have a combination. If we just get the two working yeah. at the same time, it'll all work out. Gather it up. Thanks. The victory by Chris Caramassini's gave him the opportunity to move into the final four. 
where his competition was Joe Amato. Well, Lori John suddenly became a Caramazzini's fan. She needed the red car to put away the blue car from Pennsylvania. It appeared Amato had it in the sack, but here came the Greek. After smoking the tires at the starting line, Caramazzini's recovered and put away a troubled Joe Amato. A funny thing happened on the way to the finals in Top Fuel and Funny Car. Bob Newberry in the near lane in his alcohol funny car split an engine open, dumping oil down the entire lane of the racetrack. Paul Johnson won the race, but because of gathering darkness and the fact that there are no lights at San Air, the finals were run on Monday morning. Steve talked to Ormsby. Well, I think if we weren't running for the champions, Steve, I, I don't even know if I'd even go to the starting line. I just let the Greek have it. He's been racing for 30 plus years, and he's never won a national event. But we got to go up there and try to beat the guy because we are running for the world championship. You hear that sound in the background? That's the man that wants to take this first victory away from you, Gary Ormsby. He doesn't want to, but he has to if he can. Is that right? Maybe I should go talk to him. Maybe we can work a deal. <laughs> Generosity is one thing. Championships are another, and Gary Ormsby was not about ready to let this one get away. Incredible. It's cool and misty and oily as a near lane one. It still held Ormsby's 520 a lap time. And the Greeks' crap tire smoking 538. But as for Chris, well, he was still smiling. He had a great time. He's always having a good time if he's at the drag strip. Ormsby's grin increased even when he found out that he enjoyed a very slim points lead over Joe Amato and that he and Amato had pushed Lori Johns further into that third spot. In Funny Car on Monday morning, it was John Force against Mark Oswald. Force going for an unprecedented for him fourth victory in a single season, while Mark Oswald had yet to win in 1990. The confidence displayed by these racers in NHRA's cleanup capability amazing. Ormsby took the near lane, so did Force, and it paid off for them both. We got to thank Steve Gibbs and the safety safari crew for doing one hell of a job of fixing that oil down lane and prepping the track here in the mist this morning. Yeah, they did a fine job. But how about this guy? You guys fight a lot, but you can't today. Well, this guy's the best there is, but I'm tired of telling him his head gets too big. That's hard to believe. John Force having an ego. He should. He led the Winston points chase after San Air. Ed McCulloch second. Bruce Larson without a win is in third. And a terrific pro stock final, the ever-improving dodge of Daryl Alderman up against the Pontiac Trans Am of Jerry Ekman. And Ekman on this day would be mistake-free. A good, clean start. Alderman had the early advantage. Ekman had a lot of confidence in the power plant under the hood, and it paid off. 732 to a 735, and the two, well, they shook hands, as sportsmen do. That victory padded the Winston Point lead for Ekman. Warren Johnson stayed in second. Morgan third. Bob Glidden moved up to number four, while Bruce Allen dropped to fifth. It was just a short drive from San Air near Montreal, Canada, down to New Jersey at the Budweiser Summer Nationals at Old Bridge Township Raceway Park, and this place was just jammed with enthusiastic spectators. And here, lots of improvements too, Dave. The new grandstands we just saw, they're absolutely packed with humanity, and we can see the new tower and all of the VIP suites, all the tracks around the country, putting their best foot forward. And this facility will be done in time for the 1991 summers. Jerry Ekman, the champion at Montreal, came from San Air Raceway to Raceway Park with high hopes. He expected to be able to duplicate the kind of performances that Larry Morgan had had earlier in the season and put together a string of victories and even further pad his lead. But it was a fellow Pontiac racer, Kenny Delco, who came to the line against Ekman in round number one. Delco had nothing to do with it. It was Jerry Ekman, red light. Well, the only consoling words I guess I have for Jerry Ekman is if you're news when you lose, your career's intact. First round, brutal. Well, that's tough. That's a tough way to lose. We were in the points lead, or we're still in the points lead. I, I hope we can get away from this race with us still in the lead, but... Uh, a rare red light for you. Yeah, I got a little over anxious, I guess. You know, Kenny stepped up yesterday, and he's been running well. I figure I better be ready for him, and I guess I just got a little over anxious, and it happens. Indeed. Delco did, however, run quicker, so red light or not, it might have gone Kenny's way. In the final round, it was the Dodge again with its soft-spoken Kentucky driver, Daryl Alderman, who seems to have made best friends with the Christmas tree. Again, it was Alderman out first, this time over the record holder, Mark Powick. Alderman had qualified number one and won the Summer Nationals. 
just a shame that Mark and myself both couldn't have won this one because I know both of us have been real close this year, but I'm really glad that Daryl Halderman was the winner of this one. Jerry Ackman did continue to lead after the Summer Nationals. Second was Warren Johnson, Morgan stayed third, Bob Glidden fourth, and Daryl Alderman made an appearance as number five in the Winston Point standing. Back in the top fuel fray was the long ball thrower, former NFL quarterback for the Houston Oilers, the Oakland Raiders, the Los Angeles Rams, the Philadelphia Eagles, Dan Pastorini. In round number one, Pastorini faced off with Frank Hawley in the Glenn car. Pastorini driving John Kerry's car went up in smoke as Hawley streaked to the finish line. A time of a 5.06. So better luck next time, Dante. Well, then Frank Hawley ran head on into the number one qualifier, Joe Amato. Amato had scorched the pavement with a 4.95. Hawley had qualified well in the number four spot at 5.01. But it was Amato gone off the line, stretched it out in the middle, and went to the final round at 5.02. When you come to your home track and get to the final, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, you know? It might not get better, but it certainly got tougher as it was the contender for the repeat championship in the Winston standing, Gary Ormsby against Joe Amato in the finals at English Town. If Amato could win this race, he would take the points lead. Ormsby knew that, so he had a great start, a great finish as well. Ormsby, 5.03. The Summer Nationals title goes to Gary Ormsby. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I don't know what we ran. It felt like a pretty good run, but it was 503. Who cares? You what? Yeah, that's true. Really, who does? Huh? But he sort of upstaged us all weekend. We come out and run a 499, and he come up and run 498, and then we run a 498, and he run 495. But main thing that counts, we won this race. The victory extended Gary Ormsby's lead in the Winston Chase over Joe Amato, Lori John's third, Dick LaHaye is fourth, and Gene Snow number five after the Summer Nationals. Well, John Forrest over in the far lane was hoping that his funny car points lead coming into this event would also be extended as his teammate Ormsby's was. But then Dave McClellan, he ran up against the man from Minnesota, Tom Hoover. In round number one, John Forrest had to watch as Tom Hoover just squeezed by for the win. Yeah, I don't like those. Uh, it makes it tough, but uh, he's a good racer and uh, he did well. And uh, I don't even know what happened. Our car uh, it ran good enough to win a race. It's just he come back from where he was and stepped up on it. When we got down there, John and I both, neither one of us knew who won. I thought I won, but I wasn't going to take credit until they told me. The rookie Casey Spurlock joined some very elite people. He ran in a 519 blast in qualifying to the number one spot, one of five cars who have run in the five teams. But he got stung by low buck Johnny West. What it is more than anything is just a, it's a morale boost for our, all the guys here because we're working on peanuts right now. And, you know, to go around every once in a while, it, it does do us good. No one was having more fun than 86-year-old George Hoover, crew chief engine builder for his son, Tom. Tom on the right side of your screen squared off in the final four with Johnny West. And again, it was West. It's nice. It really is. Makes you feel decent for once that you can run with some of these guys. We may not be running the numbers, but at least we're getting there first. But in the final, can you run the number? Could you risk your precious parts to run a number to win it? Well, actually, we are trying to run a, a good number. We've stuck some of this high gear stuff in here. The high tech guys have got. And we're just murdering clutches, and I don't know what to do about it. The competition for West in the finals, Chuck Etchells. Remember back to Atlanta when Paul Smith said if they got the sponsor, they were going to step up and win one someday? Well, they got the sponsor, and Chuck Etchells raced Johnny West in the final. But all eyes were on Johnny West as the car got sideways, careened into the wall, and it was about this point that most of us realized Johnny West must be unconscious. The driver in the car making no effort to stop it. It was accelerating almost 100 miles an hour at the finish line. It gained speed. As I said at the time on NBC Sports, this will not be pretty. Head on into the retaining wall at the far end that separates the racetrack from a public highway. We feared the worst for Johnny West. Johnny West was unconscious, but the good news is he came out of this accident in pretty good shape, Steve. Yes, he did. Spent a few days in the hospital, but he's back to wrenching on other people's cars because he doesn't have one of his own currently, and here's why. 
It was determined later that a fuel line had broken and it sprayed moisture under the right rear tire. That allowed the left to continue to drive and it drove the car into the retaining wall. The initial impact knocked Johnny West out and he was just a passenger when all of this action took place. At that point on the track, the guardrail across the end runs at an angle, and that turned the flying car of West. He was taken from the vehicle and transported to the hospital, and as Steve pointed out, spent several days, but is back on the racetrack again, serving as a crew chief. But there's the funny car driver who earned his first ever national event victory, Connecticut's Chuck Etchells. The next event on the NHRA Winston Trail was in the western part of the United States in the Mile High Country near Denver, Colorado. And to no one's surprise, it's a race weekend. And what happens? It rains at Bandemir Speedway in the Mopar Parts Mile High National. It rained on Thursday. It rained on Friday. It rained on Saturday. The two qualifying runs were made on Sunday. This one, Laura Johnson, the far lane. Tommy Johnson, Jr., near lane. For Laura Johns, a fiery and expensive engine explosion. I'm fine. I just, this is really disappointing. I don't believe. I, I mean, I've never seen destruction like that before, and I've seen some pretty bad ones. This is not what's supposed to happen. Pretty humiliating. And it was certainly one of the brightest Roman candles we've seen in a long time. No heat in the cockpit, though? No, I was fine. I just got out and kind of dropped down to my knees. I couldn't believe we had so much damage. and. This is just not what you want to see happen. We, we want to do well, and this is, this, this is not supposed to happen. But happen, it did. In fact, to such an extent, the chassis was damaged beyond repair, and Lori had to pull out of the Denver event. The rains forced NHRA into a decision they had not made in years, Steve. They ran the race on Monday night. And the fans showed up by the thousands. And a lot of them had to be rooting for this guy, Junior Kaiser from Colorado. He qualified 13th, and in round number two raced Kenny Bernstein. We rode along with Kenny. And with this onboard shot, you can feel everything but the G-forces as Bernstein puts away Kaiser. You know, normally at sea level, when I tell Kenny Bernstein he ran a 5.23 at Brown, that ought to bring a grin. Oh, it's fantastic, Steve. It's great to kind of be back sort of like, you know, and make a good run. This is the first time, Steve, since Pomona that Kenny Bernstein has showed any flash of performance brilliance. His driving has been great throughout the early part of the season, but here at Denver and the Mile High Nationals in the Final Four, he was against Gary Hornsby and took the victory. It's unbelievable. I tell you, what a run with Hornsby. That he was right there I, at the finish line, Steve. I looked over and I said, Maybe a fender, or in these cars, maybe a wheel. That was it. Heck of a race. After Ormsby's loss in the final four, Joe Amato, on the right-hand side of your screen, advanced into the finals, the points leader. And it was Bernstein and Amato in the final round. Now, the light Kenny Bernstein thought he saw at the end of the tunnel, well, it turned out it was a light on a freight train like top field or extra in the opposite lane as you see Amato sneak by for the mile-high win. Kenny Bernstein settled for runner-up. It's been a hallmark of this team to be consistent, but we've lost too many finals, and we're aiming to turn that around. We need to keep Joel king of the hill. The third consecutive victory at Denver by a motto moved him into the points lead over Ormsby, and those two began to pull away from the rest of the pack. Well, at this stage in the season, everybody thinking about points, maybe more than they did earlier on. And heavy on the mind of Jerry Ackman as he staged his yellow Pontiac in round one against Joe Lapone Jr. was the fact that he has been losing in round one and giving ground. He still had the points lead coming into Denver, but it was in jeopardy in left. He could smoke Lapone here. But Steve, it was not to be. The slight advantage gained by Ackman was lost at the finish. I don't think I was late on the line. In fact, I think I might have left on Joe. Uh, we got halfway down the track and the motor stumbled and he went around me, but I was out on him and pulling away and it just, I don't know, this place is a tough, tough place to run fast. He said it all for everybody. That first round loss by Ekman was costly. It moved him down in the point standings to second. Warren Johnson up to number one. Larry Morgan won the race and he stayed in third. Darrell Alderman fourth, Bob Glitton number five. Well, the wonder of the Nitro Night Racing continued on Thunder Mountain. Look at this gorgeous slow motion burnout from Tom Hoover. 
It was the final four with Hoover up against Jim White, the poor guy that just can't seem to get a break. White was in the near lane, Hoover in the far lane, but watch the far lane. Hoover blows an engine. A horrible oil fire, but does a masterful job of scrubbing speed off the car. Those were intentional maneuvers you saw out the roof hatch, and that kept the damage to the machine to the minimum. And Steve, the better news is the damage to Tom Hoover. Well, there wasn't any. He was A-OK -okay after this incident. White went on to lose to Ed McCulloch in the final, and Steve was there to talk to Tom. All I could think about was some of the experiences we had over the years, and I uh, did my best to stop it. I'm telling you what, the smoke is plenty heavy in there. At one point, I was out of the car because I couldn't breathe, and the car was still running. I went back down and made sure the fuel shut was off so the motor would shut off, but it was plenty uh, exciting there for a while. By getting it stopped and getting the fire out, you minimize the damage to the car. It's my money, and I'm stopping that, baby. I almost hit the guardrail. Well, at Denver, we all savored the nighttime racing. Might never see it again. Well, Tom Hoover still had a race car left to join the Winston Tour as it headed further west to Sonoma, California, the wine country, and the Motorcraft Board, California Nationals. California, here we come, and they did in droves. Over 68,000 people jammed into Sears Point International Raceway near Sonoma. That's just outside of San Francisco, and they were treated to one great drag race, Steve. You know, in round number two, Joe Amato, the points leader, met up with the newly resurgent Chris Caramacinis, and Jerry Amato told me before the race, we used to think the Greek was an easy one, fun to race but no problem, not anymore. Still fun to race, but they got to consider the fact that the man is capable of running five O's on any given racetrack on any given day. He had qualified in the 10th position at a 516 uh, on the Sonoma Asphalt. Amato the number two spot at a 5.04. Amato red lighted for the second time this year. The Greek did an old fashioned 1320 burnout to survive round number two. Steve, that certainly opened the door for Gary Ormsby in the Winston points chase. They're seesawing back like it's a teeter-totter. One's on top at the moment, and then it goes down, and the other one comes up. Ormsby was against Eddie Hill. Ormsby had a control problem that steered it back to the center and got him. David, we're with Joe, who just watched Gary Ormsby win. You didn't need to see that win light. Well, Steve, it's, it's a tough points race right now, you know. Just, uh, I guess I had brain fade up there on the starting line. Just... You know, trying to get a good light and do a good job and, uh, you know. No excuses? No, I just, uh, you know, I don't know whether the car creeped a little bit or something, but, you know, the red light came on. No matter what happened, I'm in control, so driver error, that's all you can say. Well, Gary, the only thing almost as thrilling as winning yourself is to see a motto red light. Yeah, I did see that, and I, I don't want to say I was happy, but I was. <laughs> Now, that's an honest man, Steve, I must say. At least he admits the fact that he's cheering for himself, and you know that Joe Amato is rooting for himself, too. And the crowd was up at the very side of the gold car of Daryl Gwynn, now being driven by Frank Hawley. Drag racing fans all over the country following the progress after the accident of Daryl Gwynn. Up against Dick LaHaye and some controversy. LaHaye's crew chief, his daughter Kim, was late starting the car. Holly backing up, didn't see LaHaye and started to get concerned. Where is he? Not wanting to overheat his engine and maybe make too much horsepower, or worse yet, blow it up. As you can see, Holly was already back to the starting line when LaHaye made his burnout. And he keeps pointing, why does it, where is he? What's going on, said Frank Holly. Well, what went on was LaHaye backing up into his own tracks as Frank Hawley was getting just about as hot as his engine. You can see him looking around, nodding to Buster Couch, the starter, saying, hey, let's get something going. Well, you see, Hawley was the number one qualifier at 501. And when you run those numbers and you're number one, you're on the verge of smoking the tires already. Finally, the two cars began their staging procedure. Hawley in the near lane. LaHaye was in the far lane. A great race, and Hawley prevails. Out of the race car comes Frank Hawley. He appears to be an unhappy man, Steve. Well, David, I was down at the far end of the racetrack, and all that animation you see from Hawley was caused by what he felt was, well, an old-fashioned racer burned down, and he was right in LaHaye's face about it, too. I don't think they've shaken hands yet about that one. Frank Hawley went on to win his final four race. That earned him the shot against Gary Ormsby in the finals at the California Nationals. 
Ormsby was in the far lane, Hawley in the near lane. But it was all Gary Ormsby in front of his hometown crowd as the crew celebrated. Crew chief Lee Beard was doing the mental mathematics on the points, and they showed that Gary Ormsby had retaken first place, 9,754 points. Right behind him, Joe Amato, and the rest of the field continued to fall back. Well, everybody gathered things up and headed to the Great Northwest and Seattle International Raceway for the Jolly Rancher Candies Northwest Nationals. And they were visited by the U.S. Navy's Blue Angels. A fly-by on Saturday, a real treat for everyone. Well, funny car driver Frank Cranberger had an afterburner of his own in qualifying. The car, normally known as the Philadelphia Flyer, well, became known as the Philadelphia Friar. And you're about to see why. We have ignition. Unlike Tom Hoover, Cranberger, probably because the brakes were burning off the rear of the car, couldn't get it stopped quite as quick. Really filled with black smoke. In a second, you'll see another funny car driver, Casey Spurlock, right there, rush in to help Cranberger. I pulled all the levers that I had, that I had at my disposal, and that was the end of that. Game time. You know, what can I say? <sighs> And an ironic note to the Northwest National, KC Spurlock in round number two against Bruce Larson. Used his number three qualifying spot at a great 5.30 to come in as a favorite against Larson. But he, unfortunately, duplicated the performance of Frank Kremberger. That's right, apparently fires can be contagious as well as some other things. And this was almost a mirror image of the Kramberger incident where Spurlock rushed into help. Now he was looking for Frank. He's looking for help of any kind. He opened the escape hatch on the top. No, he's not sending smoke signals. He's actually trying to get it to stay open. The car went off the edge of the track and KC Spurlock rolled out. I find Steve, it got close to the lights and I was behind. It was moving around quite a bit and it popped. And as soon as it popped, and you know, I could see the flames coming out from underneath, so you know, I just tried to get her stopped, shut down, and uh, get the fire bottles on. I'm fine. Good driving. Well, Casey Spurlock was fine, but his car was not. Some serious damage. The fire causing the fiberglass body to basically delaminate. And when it does that, it junk. Yeah, not all the easy off in the world would have cleaned that one up. All right, Mark Oswald versus John Forrest, an all-important part of the final four. Of course, Forrest way up there at the points, and Oswald trying to get there. There was still enough season left to, to make some progress. Mark Oswald and the Candies and Hughes team had been having clutch problems all season long. Not that it was anything serious in regards to causing damage to the vehicle. It was the problem they could not get everything to work right at the right time. And even though Forrest had qualified number one, they were having super supercharger problems. Here they had Mark Oswald problems as Mark just flat put John Forrest away. You know, the competition tells me they hope you never find that clutch secret with the horsepower you're capable of making. They put it or not, the mood I'm in after the little slump we've been in here lately, we gotta come back hard. The final in funny car found Ed McCulloch in that point chase with John Forrest against Mark Oswald. Oswald in the far lane. A tremendous race that found Oswald by two car lengths, the victor for the first time this season here at Seattle. And you know you've had a great event when you can take out both John Forrest and Ed McCullough, who did survive, however, to continue to be one and two in the points, respectively. 1990 will not be the season that goes into the scrapbook of memories as a happy one for Bob Glidden. Halfway through the year, he's still struggling after his win earlier in the season at the Arizona Nationals. He was confronted with that did not qualify in Columbus, and here in the finals, he raced the Oldsmobile of Mark Powell. And Glidden had to be wondering, how many times can this kid lose in the finals? The answer was, one more time to his own Ford Pro. You know... It's incredible. I don't know how many we've won, but this is the first one we've won for a long, long time. Nice race. You're going to win one someday. <laughs> Honest, Steve. You know, it's our third final this year. One of these days, it's got to happen. Man. It, you know, I couldn't lose to a better guy. Bob's really been struggling this year, and I'm glad to see him coming back. I just wish it was me this time around. <laughs> Glidden's victory certainly kept him in the points chase. If you don't have a calculator, it's just a little over 900 points separating the top five cars in pro stock with W.J. Warren Johnson in the lead.
Well, in the top fuel category, two cars commanding everybody's interest, Gary Ormsby and Joe Amato. One and two in the points there, respectively, and they faced each other in the final four round. Watch the car in the far lane, Joe Amato. Watch the motor behind his helmet. Watch it go, boom, kaboom. But it was on a good run, it was, you know, I was ahead of him whatever part of the track, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, you know. Our racing luck isn't running too good, but we'll be back. We'll make a run at it yet. Gary Ormsby raced Chris Caramassini's in the final, and Ormsby notched yet another victory. And it was on to Brainerd, Minnesota. Usually, we get nice, sunny, summertime conditions. Not so this year, it might as well have been February, as cold and rainy as it was for every day of the event. Made it tough on the competitors. Steve, the Quaker State North Star National saw yet again another one of those engine explosions that resulted in fire. Bruce Larson coming at you ablaze. Bruce Larson, who seldom breaks anything, even burns a piston, shows that this malady can strike anywhere, no matter how well financed the team might be. He parked it nose first against the guardrail to get out in a hurry. Well done, Bruce. Would have been if he hadn't gotten out. You have a kind of a sense of direction where you're going, and I knew I was sideways a couple times, and it wasn't until the last instant that I thought I was in trouble, and then I tapped the guardrail a little bit, and it seems to take forever when you go to get out of the car. If you've ever thought this is an easy job, take a ride with John Force. This was in qualifying. Watch the little Lexan windows in the firewall. That's when Force first knows he's in big trouble. Now a little of that fire creeps into the cockpit as well as that interior tin is manufactured. That can still happen as it starts to shrink and expand. Steve, this is one of the few times that the fans have actually gotten an opportunity to see from a driver's point of view what goes on when the fire occurs and through those windows, watch the fire build. Watch John Forrest exit this car. Here's a man that wants out. The help is on the way. Forrest, his only injury was to his shoulder. Old fire suit saved me and uh, our damn boys here were right on the job. They was on top of me putting out the heat. So uh, just uh, hope we hang on to that low qualifying spot. We hung our necks out and uh, like I said again, McCullough, Oswald, Larson, you guys, we ain't dead. We only gonna get a little tougher now. Okay, John. Bruce, shoulder and all, he did hang on to the number one spot. Steve, the action continued in round number one as Doc Holliday from his number 10 qualifying spot squared off against Tom Hoover for a battle of bragging rights in the state of Minnesota. Watch the car in the far lane, Doc Holliday. Holiday headed for Hoover, out of control, narrowly misses the rear of Hoover's car. Hoover had to be shocked to suddenly see Holiday on his right. Holiday cut down a left rear tire, much as we saw Jim White do earlier. Did a brilliant driving job to avoid Hoover. Doc, that was one heck of a job of driving. It was tough. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought I was going to get hit Tom. I had to come around on the inside of him, and I just pushed it up against the guardrail and held on. And still error in that inner liner. Oh, the inner liner did a great job. That saved us. All right, next on the firing line was Glenn Micris, who had qualified number nine on the Joe Paisano car, had beaten KC Spurlock, that's the beautiful candy apple car, in the near lane opposite John Forrest. An insult to injury. Not only did Micris leave a red light on the starting line, he also exploded the supercharger into a ball of flame. The John Forrest crew had no time to be talking to me or anybody else as they changed engines every round. Their opponent in the final, Ed McCullough, his crew chief, well, I ask him. Absolutely. We feel real confident going into this final. I mean, they're very, again, we were given a lot of credit for their performance ability, but we think we can step this thing right up. So we're, we're feeling real good about going into this final. This was a match between the challengers and the Winston Point standing. John Forrest, the leader, Ed McCullough trying to catch him. Tried to catch him all the way down the 1,320 feet at Brainerd, but it was John Force after a tremendous amount of work winning. These guys are great because you know what? It was almost over down there. Everybody was beat, and I just didn't think they could hang on much longer. I was sleeping in the lounge. I got to tell you the truth, I was beat. You did a good job. I thank all you guys. You did too, man. And winning has made yeah. almost all the pain go away in that shoulder, unless, of course, beating him on the back brings it back it's the pain in the checkbook that'll take a little while to heal after this they did leave a trail of smoldering parts here at Brainerd Steve you could certainly say Austin Coyle knows his driver who's in the lead in the Winston points chase it was here at Brainerd that Amato and Ormsby met once again Lee in Seattle when Ormsby raced Amato you said something interesting the drivers are so even this is a battle between myself and Tim Richards of the Amato camp 
Yeah, I think that's true. It's obvious that every time we race them, it's a big round for either myself or for Tim Richards. It's not a matter of who does what right, it's who makes a mistake. In Seattle, we both made mistakes. His was a little bit bigger than mine, and we ended up winning. We're going up here with everything we can to win. Hopefully, mine will be a little bit better than his. When Joe and Gary Armsby meet, they may look over at each other in the starting line. You're looking over at his crew chief, and he's looking back. Oh, yeah. Everything we do here is based on what we think Lee might do in this next race, and uh, his track record is very good to this point. I mean, we need to win more of these races against him, and it's always a battle on, on my part against the other crew chief. Well, Lee Beard hoped to win with speed. Tim Richards with a great launch up the starting line in a quick elapsed time. And it rendered. It was Tim Richards and Joe Amato with the right combination. Brainerd's first four-second run of 4.99. Every time we in Hornsby run, it's, it's, you know, it's tight jaws time. It's fun to be first in the fours at any track you visit. Be the first one to do it here. We've been tearing them up this year, boy. Tim Richards and my guys have been really giving me a lot of power. Amato went on to win the North Star Nationals with an even quicker time that moved him closer to Gary Ormsby. And we all packed up and moved to the granddaddy of them all, the NHRA U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Since 1955, the biggest and the best it always will be, I feel, Dave McClellan. And I agree, and Gary Ormsby proved once again the talent that he had, and is he qualified in the number one spot with a 499? But it was round number one when he met disaster. He met the 16th qualifier, the slowest car in the field in the near lane, Wayne Bailey. It was a hot day, a tricky track. They both smoked the tires, but it was Bailey who won because he had less power, not more. That round one loss at the U.S. Nationals was a pivotal point in the championship. Well, anytime you race automobiles, you uh, have to expect that there's going to be high points in your career and there's going to be low points in them. Today was definitely a low point for us. We came into this race with some so-called experimental engine components. The rest of the teams won't have access to this equipment until after the first uh, of the year. It's making a tremendous amount of power, running six, seven miles an hour faster than everybody. A car that has that type of power is real susceptible to tra changing track conditions, and uh, we just misjudged the racetrack a little bit here this morning. In round number two, Joe Amato, a two-time champion here, winning in 1987 and 1988, raced Dick LaHaye. Oh, and was Amato hungry. He knew that Ormsby was out. He knew that every win light was 200 more points. LaHaye smoked the tires. Amato did not and whipped him with a 5.06, 275. Joe Amato could not have written a script for himself any better than this. Congratulations, new points leader. Thank you, Steve. Boy, it's called pressure, buddy. You know, we, we, Ormsby's been lucky all year. Every time we had a chance to get ahead, something happened, to, he would just pull luck. So I just kept saying to my guys, the luck's got to change, and when it comes our way, we're going to make a move. No luck with a 5.06. Well, Tim and the guys, you know, they're just doing a good job making the car real steady, going down the track, and all I got to do is try and do my job driving. One of the most poignant stories that captivated both this huge crowd and the racing world at large was that of a young man seriously injured in April of 1990. One year ago this day, Daryl Gwynn was the happiest man on the grounds, having just won the U.S. Nationals top fuel title. But for the past five months, his every effort had not been directed toward the sport he loved, but to his very survival. It happened on April 15th, during an exhibition run at Santa Pod Raceway in Bedfordshire, England, northwest of London. All Daryl intended was a half-pass checkout run when tragedy struck. The car violently shredding apart and hitting the wall. Gwen's injuries were massive, resulting in the loss of the lower half of his left arm as well as significant paralysis. Since that dreary day in the British Isles, Daryl clinged to one dream, to return to the site of his greatest victory, Indianapolis. This day, that dream came true as Daryl Gwynn was welcomed home.
I never thought I'd be welcome here to the U.S. Nationals like I have been this weekend. Uh, I knew everybody would be glad to see me, but uh, not in the way and the shape and the form and the love and the care that they have all shown this weekend. Uh, between that and my car running so good and uh, everybody behind us, it's um, it's been a real dream come true for me because I set a goal to be here and uh, here I am. Darrell also set a goal for his team to put his dragster, now driven by Frank Hawley, into the finals of the U.S. Nationals for the second year in a row. In the final four, his competition was Kenny Bernstein. He smoked the tires right off the line, giving an easy victory to Hawley after the win. Don Garlitz talked strategy with Darrell. Well, it slowed down just a little bit, Darrell. Well, we played the conservative role. We knew we didn't have to run a low, low 5-0 because Bernstein has been in the five teens. We figured if we left right with him, uh, we could race with him. Um, 506 is what we thought it would run. Um, you always remember the final of the U.S. Nationals. It's a different ball game. The weather gets cooled down. The track gets cooled down. Uh, I think it'll be a real good race between Frank and Amato. Well, Darrell was hoping the track would cool down because they did not have lane choice over Joe Amato. They missed that by a couple of thousands of a second. So Joe Amato was in the near lane where the previous round he had run a 5.06. He put Frank Holly in the Gwen car in the far lane where we saw Kenny Bernstein smoke the tires. Joe knows drag racing. His third NHRA U.S. Nationals crown over Frank Hawley. What can you say but just a very fine job well done. Well, uh, Don, uh, as you know, we won this race, race twice before. And this winning this race is like none other during the year. Uh, this is the U.S. Nationals. And uh, it's with mixed emotions a little bit because uh, Darrell's connection with that car, he, he humbles us all with his attitude. You know, it, it's really, it's really, uh, I don't know. There's no words to say it. He has got an unbelievable attitude, hasn't he? Well, it's, it's unbelievable, and it, it, it's just something for somebody to come through with something like that. I, I really admire him and his family. <laughs> right, Jerry. That one's my honey right here, buddy. She sticks on me thick and thin, and she does the job on the car. Makes, makes me do what I do. Well, it was a great day for Joe, Jerry Amato, and Tim Richards. A really crummy day for Gary Ormsby, who going out in the first round lost his points lead and saw Amato jump way in front. Steve, after the fires at Seattle and then again at Brainerd, we thought we had seen just about everything until along came Whit. Whit Bazemore and the wheel of the Bazemore and Evans Pontiac burst into flame just before the finish line and continued all the way down the racetrack. Well, Dave, this was one of the fires where we really feared for the driver's safety. He was in the car so long. Well, uh, the car was shaking pretty bad and uh, got to, uh, it seemed about half track and it uh, must have kicked a rod out or something and uh, had, a, had a small fire and it grew. <laughs> It may have grown, but Whit Bazemore came out of it unscathed. Well, there was a big prize Sunday afternoon in Budweiser's Big Bud shootout for the eight top funny cars in the land. The final round between John Force, near lane, Bruce Larson in the far lane, and the fires weren't over yet. Force had won the $50,000, but had bigger things to be concerned with. Steve, the parachute burned off the back of the car, but John remained cool under fire and brought it to a safe stop. John, you've been living with this threat of fire every run for two races. Exciting, ain't it? Hey, uh, Gary, the only thing I was worried about, you know I got a brand new car here sitting in Perdome's shop, but I didn't want to use it, this thing, just a, a real Hellraiser, and I couldn't get it off the fence, it was right on the fence. I only touched her once, it didn't get into the chassis. NHRA and their deal saved us. Bud shoot out, Castro, Jolly Rancher, Whack Shop, Easy Wider, we're earning our paychecks. <laughs> And on Monday, Labor Day, he had to continue to earn them. As in round number two, it was Force against McCullough. Before the race, I asked Ace his thought. Ed, I know there's no time for socializing, but if you could say something right now to John Forrest before this race, what would it be? It's not over till it's over. We'll see here pretty quick, John, what it's going to be. If we got to beat, if we're going to do anything in this championship, we have to win right now. That's what we intend to do. I asked Forrest the same question. He said, Ace, don't be late to work. 
It's ironic that John Force used the word late because that's what applied to Ed McCulloch in this side-by-side -side match. He was about five hundredths of a second behind Force leaving the starting line, but he got to the finish line first when John Force lost traction and had to recover. And back in Tom Hoover's trailer was his 86-year-old father, George, getting that mount ready. Remember them from the Summer Nationals. They had some good success there. But this was the final round, and the ace was still high from beating John Force and points hungry, looking for his fifth U.S. Nationals win. And he got it. Steve, with that victory, Ed McCulloch wrote himself into the record books as the winningest funny car driver in the history of the U.S. Nationals. And the emotion of the crew certainly shows it. He also brought his points total to within 500 of John Force. That is less than three rounds of racing with four events yet to be contested. In Pro Stock Eliminator, it was Larry Morgan going for the title for the second year in a row. Earlier, he had already collected the big bucks by winning the Mr. Gasket Hurst Pro Stock Challenge. In the finals at the U.S. Nationals on Labor Day, he was against Jerry Ekman, the man that has moved in and out of the Winston Points lead like a revolving door. It was a brilliant start by both drivers. One of the greatest pro stock finals in Nationals history, it was Jerry Ekman in the Pontiac. This was the first time that the team of Jerry Ekman and Bill Orndorff had won the U.S. Nationals, and they certainly knew how to celebrate. You took a gamble. You took the motor out, there was nothing wrong with it, and you tried another engine. Right. That, I certainly did. I, I, it was quite a gamble because uh, We've been having problems earlier in the round, and we just uh, didn't know, and we figured we, we need some more performance for the final. Looks like it paid off. It was a good guess. Congratulations, U.S. Nationals champion. Excellent. My dream come true. Amazing what a victory can do. It moves Jerry Ekman back into the lead in the Winston points chase. W.J. second, Morgan third, Glidden fourth, and Alderman was number five. After all the pressure of the U.S. Nationals, it is really special to go to the country environment of Maple Grove Dragway near Redding, Pennsylvania. And even though the weather was a little on the drizzly side, it certainly didn't take the edge off of the anticipation and all the expectations of the race. But one other thing made it even more special. It was the bottom of the ninth, two out, bases loaded, the home team trailing by one run when top fuel dragster driver Kenny Koretsky stepped up to the plate at Reading, Pennsylvania's Municipal Stadium. The occasion, the Daryl Gwynn benefit softball game between the NHRA Winston Pro All-Stars against the greats of NASCAR, the Winston Cup All-Stars. Earlier, the partisan crowd of over 15,000 rose as one to welcome Daryl Gwynn, the NHRA Top Fuel champion who suffered paralyzing injuries in an Easter Sunday accident in England. The proceeds from the game would go to Daryl's recovery fund, helping offset some of the expenses estimated at over two and a half million dollars. The NASCAR fans had plenty to cheer about in the top of the ninth as Michael Waldrop slammed a tape measure grand slam home run, putting the super speedway stars on top by four runs. But as Yogi Berra once said, it's not over till it's over. The Nitro drag racing drivers clawed their way back into contention until it was 20 to 19. Bases loaded, two out, when Goretzky stepped into a pitch from Ernie Irvin and slammed a sharp double to center field, scoring first Dan Pastorini and then Richard Hartman with the winning run. The victory by the NHRA Pro All-Stars was a fitting climax to a most emotional evening which raised $150,000 for the Daryl Gwynn Recovery Fund. It was a night, Dave McClellan, that none of us will ever forget. Steve, it was on Sunday that Daryl was presented with the symbolic check signifying the $150,000 that was raised that Thursday night in Reading, Pennsylvania. In the top fuel points war, it was Joe Amato who fired the first volley. Joe, you got exactly what you wanted, a track record, low qualifier, 494. Oh. We were looking for it, Steve. I mean, Tim was fooling with some stuff up till today, and the air is right, everything's right. It might not hold, though. You know, a couple good cars left in the lanes there. But 494, we'll take it for now. I'll bet you will.
One of those cars still in the lane was Gary Ormsby, and he fired a shot that was heard through the entire top fuel rank. Joe Amato fires a 494 at Gary Ormsby and says, take that. Ormsby fires back 493. Oh, I felt really good. We just wanted to get down the track then, you know. We smoked the tires earlier, Steve, and we didn't, uh, they were thinking about changing it just before we ran. Uh, good thing we didn't, huh? Could be worth 50 points if it holds for low ET. Yeah, I hope so. We need everything we can get right now. It does indeed. In the final four of Top Fuel, Gene Snow just edged out Joe Amato to put him out of the chase, then came to the final round, having taken low ET in round number one with an even quicker 493 to race Gary Ormsby. Oh boy, Ormsby knew this could be a tough one. As it turned out, it wasn't when Gene Snow's engine exploded. Gary Ormsby won the Sunoco Keystone Nationals and the points that went with it. And Steve, he needed every one of them. He ended this race 48 points behind Joe Amato. In pro stock, it was just one race ago at the U.S. Nationals that Jerry Ekman took the points lead. He was hoping to capitalize on that lead, but again, he had big problems in round number one. Round number one has been the toughest for him. If he can get to the final, it's a piece of cake. He red-lighted again. I truly hope that uh, you know you red-lighted, and I'm not the one telling you. Oh, I didn't know I red-lighted. Oh, no, how close of a light was it? I'm not sure about the light, but you wasted a 727. Oh, God, I'm gonna, oh, my crew's gonna be disappointed as well as I am. Oh, I can't believe that. Can't believe that, hey, it's racing, I guess. Now, you know, if you don't press that light, you wouldn't be the points leader. Well, the former points leader now. Oh, that's tough. Steve, that's got to be a tough job, the bearer of bad news. Yes, it is, Dave. It was at this point, though, at Maple Grove, the competition started noticing that pesky Dodge was around. And around at Maple Grove for the final against Bob Glidden and his Ford Pro. Glidden red-lighted his shot away. The short wheelbase they tell me it likes a good track like Maple Grove. It sure does, and that's, you know, that's why it's ET'd good here, and it, and it didn't ET good at Indy. Well, you know now you can run as quick as anybody in the world of pro stock. Yeah, all we gotta do is find the right track to run on. <laughs> That's him, the pro stock champion. That first round loss for Jerry Ekman was disastrous at the Keystone Nationals. He dropped from first to fourth. Warren Johnson was number one. Larry Morgan seconded. Bob Glidden moved up to third. Mark Oswald had the kind of performance he enjoyed in Seattle. Here we see him doing John Ford's a great big favor in the semifinals, taking out Ed McCullough to earn a final round berth against, guess who? John Force. The final round forced into the late evening hours as an afternoon rain shower came through the Maple Grove area. John Force in his second Keystone Nationals final round in a row used a hole shot to move past Oswald for the title. The best part is it's not on fire, it's not even singed. Maybe those troubles are over. She's clean. I heard her on the you burnout. A 33 to 30. <laughs> on the burnout, I knew she was an animal, and Coyle said he was going for it. I was, I was real nervous about her, but he ought to ask Coyle what he thinks, because this guy, I put a load on him, and I beat him up, and I'm just, I'm tired of it. Coyle, give me some love over here, huh, buddy? One thing we never tire of is listening to John Forrest. And Steve, it's obvious that one thing he never tires of is talking. But John Force is one of those drivers capable of putting his performance where his words are. He maintained his lead over Ed McCulloch in the points chase. See the star on the map right there that's blinking? Well, now you know why they call the newest super track on the NHRA circuit, Heartland Raceway Park in Topeka, the home of the AC Delco Heartland Nationals, and the racetrack is as good as it looks. Witness this in qualifying. Gary Ormsby, the quickest elapsed time in history, the fastest speed drag racing has ever seen. The car, do I need to tell you, in the far lane, the fans were stunned. 488, 296 miles per hour. Gary, 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 can you believe it? The quickest time in the history of the sport at 488. No, I can't. I mean, uh, I knew it was stout, but I didn't know it was that stout. 
And there were a lot of rumors that it was trick magnetos that caused his car to run 290. They're gone, and it runs 296. I know, it ran faster. What are you going to say? Huh? <laughs> that means the tricks that Lee Beard had set around this car are still there. That's for sure. This car has ran good the last two or three races, and what he's doing, I don't even know what he's doing, but I like it. <laughs> Back in 1987, Dick LaHaye was the Winston Points champion. Here in the 1990 season, by the time the racers reached Heartland Park and the Heartland Nationals, he was cast in the role of a spoiler. And he played that role to the hilt. In the final four, it was Gary Ormsby and Dick LaHaye. LaHaye had his share of handling problems, did not let it bother him as he moved past Ormsby and held the lead to the finish line for the win. Well, Gary, what we've seen in that near lane, nobody could fault your judgment going up there with a 510 in the car, trying to cut and almost cutting the perfect light. Yeah, Steve, uh, we give it about all we thought that lane would take and what we'd seen in previous rounds, so that's all we can do. And I see the tires are blistered here right now, so I don't think we could have done much better. We don't know. They might run low in the next lane, but that's about all we could have done today, I think. David, as the finals rolled to the starting line, we were reminded that it was Jerry Amato's birthday. And what present do you think her husband Joe wanted to give her? Well, obviously, the title here of the AC Delco Heartland Nationals. Joe did not have lane show, so what did he do? He hole shot at LaHaye instead. LaHaye could not pick up the deficit. Amato wanted 504 to a quicker 501, and Jerry had one of her birthday presents. The other thing she wanted was a kiss from that handsome pro stock rascal, Daryl Alderman. And Steve, guess who set it up? Joe Amato was waiting with Daryl Alderman in the shutdown area, and Jerry got her kiss. And the two didn't know each other until then. Joe Amato took a big jump in the Winston Point standings. His lead moved from 48 to 394 points after the Heartland Nationals. Remember at Maple Grove when Daryl Alderman says, I need good tracks for my Dodge? Well, after Gary Ormsby's 488, he knew he had a good track, especially that far lane. And before sharing his affection with Jerry Amato, he was busy disposing of the field. This is round one against Butch Leal. Daryl Alderman takes the national record at 720. No matter how tall the mountain, Daryl Alderman, you and your Dodge can climb it. The quickest time in the history of Pro Stock at 720. Yeah, Steve, uh, we're really tickled with that 720. I think that's the record, unless Warren run faster just a minute ago. Well, that is the record. You already have a backup. Okay, good. Uh, the car really hooked up good and low in second, and when it does that, it flies. <laughs> Indeed, it did. Yeah, thank you. Not only did Darrell Aldman in the far lane win this race over Joe Lapone Jr. in a rematch of last year's Hartford Nationals Finals, he also took the 200 bonus points that go with setting a national record. After this victory, Alderman made a prediction, I'll set the record again when I get to Dallas just two weeks away. Look at this, Darrell Alderman was in third and five drivers just a little over 500 points apart. The best news for John Forth at Topeka was the return to the sport of Mike Dunn. Now, he qualified number nine at a 538 in a brand new car, enjoying only its second outing. Now, why do I talk about Mike Dunn? Well, because in round number two of Funny Car Competition, it was Mike Dunn against Forces' nemesis, Ed McCullough. McCullough was at the point here that if he lost to Mike Dunn, well, his season was in big, big trouble. McCullough was in the far lane, done in the near lane, and that is just precisely what happened because McCullough had problems immediately right off the starting line, up in smoke. Mike Dunn won it at 546 to advance to the final four. And when he got to the final four, he did a very similar thing to Bruce Larson in a very similar fashion to make the final round. Steve, it was about a car length. That's what separated Mike Dunn from Bruce Larson. For our second race out to be in the final, we're really happy. Hasn't taken you long to get your edge back off the starting line either. Well, I feel good, you know. That's it. That's my dad's tune-up. At least good when I hit the throttle. So, I, you know, I got to give him credit for that. You know, and the rest of the crew. If the good news for John Force was that Mike Dunn was back and took out Ed McCulloch in that second round race, the bad news was the Blower Boomers were back. Again, a supercharger explosion for Force as he watched. Mark Oswald go across the finish line and take the win. Force knew that his problems were far from over. Again, a blower explosion and fire. And this one, David, came earlier than any of the others. Most of them had been a blower pop right at the finish line. This was under hard acceleration as we see it again. 
right off of the starting line. Oswald, by the way, on this winning run, ran a terrific 5.23. The force was the story. When the tires lit up, so did the engine. And in fact, so did the racetrack, David. I have never seen burning oil on the track, and I ain't no new kid on the block. What an explosion. John, your problems have been at the finish line until now. Well, same thing happened to Brainerd. I pedaled her and the motor revved up on me and Coyle said, of course, you can't get back after her, but red car made a move and, and I knew it was good numbers. Only way we were going to go was for the throat and you ain't got time to think whether you're going to blow up and catch on fire. Just try to chase that old boy down and bang, boom. Whatever. You, you came here for points and you got a few. Oh, well, we'll take some points and uh, that hurt our feelings, but money can buy that and car's safe and we you're all right. load up and head for Dallas. Well, that old boy he's talking about was Mark Oswald. And just a little bit later, Oswald went on to win the Heartland Nationals. He put together a string of four yeah, runs so in the mid-520. His crew offered congratulations. Dallas, Texas, the home of the Chief Auto Parts Nationals at the Texas Motorplex. And once again, record-shattering crowds jammed a racing facility to watch the very best in the Winston Championship chase. And David, as always, on this concrete racetrack, there was high anticipation for new records. And Jim White and Roland Williams of Wyatt Gar was happy to oblige. A 5.14, resetting the record previously held by Ed McCullough. One of the scariest moments I have ever witnessed on a racetrack came in Funny Car Eliminator round number one. Mark Oswald was in the far lane. Al Hoffman was in the near lane. Watch Mark Oswald. the ruined chassis of his race car to a stop against the guardrail. Oswald, even though he was stunned by the impact, was able to get out of the car and escorted to the back of the truck by the safety safari crew. All year long, we talked about engines hydraulicing, usually on the burnout or right up the starting line. This is the first one we ever saw at the finish line, and I don't want to see it again. There's a little puff of smoke. That may have started that chain reaction. Maybe a burn piston, then a hydraulic, and ripped the block literally apart. Mark, considering uh, how little control you had with a blown tire, you did a heck of a job. I just tried to stay as straight as I could. Steve had just had oil and everything all over the front of the visor, and uh, you know I really couldn't understand why I hit the guardrail. I thought I held the car pretty straight, but they said it pretty much lifted the car right off the ground. What were you doing when you put your hand and your glove way up in the air? I was trying to see if the body was still on. I was looking. I was feeling for the roof hatch to see if I was going to have to get out or not. I couldn't tell if the body was still on. Well, banged up a little bit, but basically you're okay. Yeah, we'll be back. I'm fine. Steve, you used the words ripped apart to describe the engine. Well, here you can see it, Dave. The cylinder head is laying on its side with the exhaust headers on the left of your screen pointed up. It just didn't blow it off the top of the block. It ripped the block apart right at the base of the cylinder walls. For well, the second race in a row, it proved out that Mike Dunn was going to play an important role in the championship. Mike, you come out with a brand new team to run a few tune-up races to get ready for next year, and you find yourself the center of attention. You could help decide the Pony Car Championship. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a surprise. So we are just basically getting our tune-up for, for 1991, and to come out here and, and run her up in our second race and then to run as well as we're doing uh, for now, that's that's pretty good, and uh, we're looking forward to for next round. Mike Dunn is becoming a bit of a pest. Well, Mike Dunn's, a, you know, they're a hard runner. They've you know, come in here with new car, new combination, and now they're out there doing just fine, you know. Steve, it's obvious that Ed McCulloch does not have fond memories of what Dunn did to him at Heartland Park just a couple of weeks ago. Now Dunn in the far lane, McCulloch in the near lane. This was round number two, and Dunn the victor. I think a 527 would be enough, and it normally would be, but down with a 25, yeah. You know, Dunn's been tough here, I mean, we really weren't, you know, I mean, we weren't concerned with Dunn any more than anybody else. I mean, you know, we're out there trying to run as good as we can, and, you know, it wasn't good enough. Next round, John Force gets Mike Dunn. Well, you know, I mean, it's as good as over. I mean, Force has had all the luck in the world. 
you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from the guys, but they're damn lucky. And how, how do you beat luck? You can't. John Voice, you just love Mike Dunn at Topeka when he beat McCullough. You loved him even more today when he again beat McCullough. Now he stands in your way. Well, I always loved him when he was a snot-nosed kid, I did. You know, you go back, him and his dad, I mean, that Abel boy over there, they made the right connection when they hired them guys because nobody, they made a mistake. Nobody ever gave them no money, and they got real grizzly out there. Uh, I speak uh, for Z's, by the way, Dave. Grizzly means big and bad. I would hope so. Well, I'll tell you, Mike Dunn was both of those things on this day in Dallas, Texas. John Forrest in the near lane, Mike Dunn in the far lane. And you think Dunn with McCullough. Watch what he does to Forrest. A 521. You know, officially, mathematically, McCullough's got a shot. But your crew is smiling. They know they're the Winston champs. Steve, I, ain't, I haven't got aggravated over losing this race yet. But you know, in the baseball game, the NASCAR guys said, you know, they thought they had it. And then I said, it wasn't over till it's over. And that fits for McCullough. And I've told my guys, you don't start thinking that way right to the end. We're gonna bust our buns right into the end and do just for our sponsors what we said we'd do. And that's when we lost here today and we got to go to Pomona and win again. He needed a qualifying run at Pomona to make him the Winston champion. He led after Dallas by 1,234 points. And then there was one. Back where the season began, it would come to a conclusion. The NHRA Winston Finals in Pomona. The weather was almost perfect for the spectators, but the hazy sunshine, the hot temperatures made the track service a bit tricky for final eliminations at this 26th annual event. Now John Forrest locked up his first Winston Funny Car Championship merely by qualifying and qualified well, second behind Casey Spurlock. But in round one on Sunday up against Tim Gross, well, John's whole kind of celebration event fell apart on him. Whether it was the distraction of winning the championship, who knows, but he made a, well, he made a fatal starting line error. He just didn't control the car properly. It crept through the beams, and you'll see in his lane the red light. Fourth was out round one. The champion had fallen. Tim Gross got a real break. Well, the crew for John Forrest probably felt that somebody changed the script in mid-shoot because it wasn't quite the ending event that they had hoped for. But John Forrest, by virtue of that qualifying effort earlier in the weekend, locked up the Winston title, his first ever after 18 years of competition. John Forrest, the season's over. What are you doing? I'll come out here and greet the fans. They won a world champ. They earned it. John Force earned himself the traditional champagne bath by clinching that Winston championship. Well, John Force failed to win the season-ending event. That title did go to the man that finished second in the series, Ed McCulloch. He received the congratulations of his final round opponent, Bruce Larson, who failed to win a single event in the 1990 season. In pro stock, they were all talking Dodge and Darrell Alderman. Alderman did as he said he would do in Dallas just two weeks prior, reset his own national record, 200 more points, came into Pomona, qualified number one with a track record, 7.28. He won right there in round number one when Jerry Haas red-lighted, and that eliminated Warren Johnson and Bob Glidden from winning the championship. Now, now it was round number two. The title was on the line. The Pontiac of Jerry Ekman. The Dodge of Daryl Alderman. If Alderman won, he owned the title. If Ekman won and went on to win the entire event, the Winston Championship was his. No one was sitting down, Dave, when these two left the starting line. Daryl Alderman, his fingers shaking as I'm sure anybody's would, that just won their first Winston championship. The helmet off, the body out of the Dodge. Congratulations. Bob Glidden is here, Larry Morgan, Tony Christian, a celebration of pro stock competitors. Daryl. Hey, I don't know what to say. Maybe I can get some sleep now, Steve. <laughs> and here's a check for $100,000. Bobby Masson of RJR, Daryl Alderman. Boy, that was quite a final race to end it. I knew it was going to be a, a good a good race between Jerry and I because it always is. Every, every run we've made has been just a couple thousands, you know, determined the winner. Everybody says you're so calm. I've watched you all weekend. You've been fidgeting and run. You couldn't keep your feet still. Oh, gosh, Steve. Don't believe that stuff. I've, I've been more nervous than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I saw. Hey, how could anybody go wrong with an uh, awesome Dodge and the Mopar parts and a Jerry Haas chassis? Hey, it was easy.
Yeah, right. It wasn't so easy in the next round, Steve. Tony Christian beat Daryl Alderman, and Christian, the winner at Dallas, raced the Ford of Bob Glidden. The victory by Glidden moved him into second in the Winston Point standings. And with the sun setting on the 1990 season, there were only two more drivers and two more crew chiefs with work to do. Lee Beard, crew chief for Gary Ormsby, we talked to him. Well, we're tuning it up to race the big guy in the final. If we get a shot at him, we're going to throw everything we can. There's a lot of money at stake. Our fans have been supporting us all year long. There's, I cannot stress to you how important it is for me to win the world championship. Well, we weren't really leaning on it too hard. Uh, I didn't want to lose, lose lane choice there, but I didn't expect the Ormsby to go that 502 either, but we'll see in the final. This track will be a lot better, I think, then. Just before the word went out to start the engine, the decision was made between Beard and Ormsby to change lanes. And that was regarded by many as the pivotal point in this race. Low ET of the event paid 50 bonus points. It was conceivable that Joe Amato, if he could run quicker than Ormsby's existing 501, could even lose this race and still be the champion. We would soon know who would wear the number one during 1991. That red light start for Ormsby settled the issue. After a season-long battle, 19 races, 46 rounds of racing, it is hard to believe that only this round truly mattered. Well, uh, I was pretty sure we could go pretty fast in the final because all day long the car was very soft. And when he gave me this left lane, I was so happy. I was sure that he made a big mistake. but. Uh, I was pretty sure we could go pretty fast, but uh, I didn't know what he could go for sure. When he went to 502 in the semi, I figured he found something out because he had been running pretty slow all, all before that point. But I don't know. This this year in this particular race, I've never been. This is this is the pinnacle of my career with Joe. Here we go. In the most drama packed top fuel final in the history of drag racing, Joe Amato has won his third Winston crown. Speechless. I guess now we can say Joe knows drag racing, buddy. <laughs> With that 493, Ormsby could have gotten the win like you'd still be the champion. Well, what can I say, Steve? You know, that was a lot of pressure and tension for the whole week, but we were trying to win the race, the whole enchilada. The, you know, but Gary, the cars, you know, they stepped up the last round. My team did an outstanding job this weekend. Boy, they came through under pressure, every one of them. And as important almost being, well, along with Don Garland and Shirley Muldowney, the only driver to have won three. That puts me in a special class to be with Don Garland, Shirley Muldowney. I can't even say my name. Now, Joe Amato, a three-time world champion. You know, to, plus, to win the championship for Team Valvoline, Keystone, all the guys at the warehouse, you know, they'll, they'll be off my case a little bit. If I lost, it would have made a tough winner. But, boy, my team, they came through in the clinch. Let's celebrate. Joe Amato is the champion, and here's the check to prove it. For Steve Evans, I'm Dave McClellan. We hope you've enjoyed Drag Racing 90, the single most exciting season in NHRA history. We're looking forward to seeing you in 1991.